The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of ONTV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And hello and welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. That's Molly Hill. I'm Joey Tysick, and we are in the middle of August. And, you know, we're only less than two weeks away from college football, basically. Week zero, to be exact. Um, I'm not too excited for week zero, but uh, I'm sure Malik's a little more excited. It's the than most I am. wonderful time of the year, Joey. I mean, we're back. Specifically, I'm back. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Um, I, I wouldn't. I, I don't expect to be betting on week zero, mm-hmm. but I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I might get the itch to bet an under on New Mexico State. Navy, Notre Dame, and San Jose State, USC. It doesn't fully interest me, but you know, it, to each their own. Listen, I need you to tune into Ohio versus San Diego State. I need you to. Those those will be two actually good teams. We'll tune tune think, in for half a quarter. We'll think about it. <laughs> half of the first quarter. Just get a little look. Okay, maybe I can promise that. Um, so we got some NFL news. We got some some college football talk. There is a little NBA news, and then we're actually going to talk about the preseason just a little bit. Um, obviously preseason doesn't completely matter, but in the NFL, it, it, again, similar to the NBA summer league, at least gives you a look at some of the young guys, and it also gets to see, you get to see more starters in preseason than, of course, like, Summer League, NBA. So it's a step up from the NBA Summer League, in my opinion. But uh, still, at the same time, you can't take too much away. Um, So starting off, our only NBA news, James Harden's kind of gone crazy. Um, Well, I can't say crazy because a lot of players are, you know, starting to want to be traded out. But he did make... James is angry again. Part yeah. seven. And he made a public yeah. statement this time. He called Daryl Morey a liar. Um, I didn't listen to the full thing because I wasn't all that interested, honestly. I, I'm kind of getting tired of the NBA drama just a little bit. It's starting to get too much for my liking. Uh, there's a point where I was okay with the NBA players having some leverage and being able to change teams if they wanted to. But it just seems like more and more lately, guys are just, I hate to even use the word whining their way out of a team, but they're whining their way out of a team um, when they're not winning or not getting the results that they want. Instead of just kind of digging in and performing better, I I don't know. It's, It's a tough battle because... You know, there's a lot of people out there that talk about, oh, well, nowadays players just want to swap teams all the time. Well, guys have been doing that and demanding trades, you know, since early NBA times, back in the 80s and 90s even. It just wasn't talked about as much. And now it's definitely more prevalent, probably ever since the decision. Um, And it's just, it's easier to see um, because of social media and all these these things that the players can use to their leverage. What do you think about James Harden? Like, do you think he's in his right? Do you think he needs to, like, where does he even go? Where would he even land that would even make sense? I think he is ruining the player empowerment era. Uh, We've seen things slowly getting worse over the past few years. Ben Simmons has been a big part of it. Everybody talked about him and everything he's gone through with his mental health issues. But this right here, how how many times can the NBA just allow James Harden to just take organizations hostage? Yeah. Basically. And be like, I'm, I'm mad at this. I need to go. I'm Mm -hmm. not playing. Right. And how many, just how many teams are going to take him on Mm -hmm. as he's, he's 34 turning 35. Like, in the next year. Yeah, people forget he's he's getting up there. 
a lot of the, well, a lot of these guys, uh, the superstars are getting pretty old. Yeah, he's he's not the guy in Houston that was putting up forty like it was nothing, mm-hmm. putting up fifty every other week. He's not that player anymore. He's an all star level player. He's still really good. Yeah, but nobody's worth all this. Mm-hmm. I mean, for you to go go over to China for I don't know, it was like a basketball camp, something like that. But yeah, he said. Uh, Daryl Morey is a liar and I will not be playing for the 76ers. And then he repeated Daryl Morey is a liar and I will not be playing for the 76ers. Yeah. And reports are now coming out that he's going to, he might just drag this on Mm -hmm. and make this as uncomfortable as possible for the 76ers. Right. Daryl Morey also needs to be brought up in this because it seems like he's fine with that happening also. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how, as an NBA GM, that's just a positive thing (laughs) for your team and coaches to just be looking at. Like, our GM Mm -hmm. is just in this individual battle and doesn't care. And he's not changing James Harden's mind, it seems like. They're just falling out. But when it comes to James Harden, um, I I just don't – I think he should retire. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that's an extreme statement at this point. Like, I think it's very clear that ba- basketball does, is not what makes him happy. Yeah, maybe just just going out there and playing. Yeah, just just playing the game right. that makes him happy. Mm-hmm. But everything else that comes with this game, it seems like he 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 hates it. He doesn't care what his teammates think, how they feel, how it affects them. Yeah, because he wants to just rip the Sixers organization to shreds slowly over the next few months. Mm-hmm. Aren't you cool with Joel Embiid? <laughs> like, right. aren't, aren't you and PJ Tucker good friends? Like, yeah. are, are you just trying to burn this team to the ground right. and just walk away with a smile on your face? Like nothing happened. Yeah. Like Nick nurse just got there. I, I just don't understand. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't understand why, why he feels the need to it, it's one thing when you find something to get mad about. Like, that's a typical superstar thing. Mm-hmm. To get annoyed or have complaints or have ultimatums with the organization, that's a regular superstar thing. Yeah. But to demand a trade and go to a new place and then demand a trade and go to another place and say you're happy at this place, I always want us to go to Philadelphia. You and Daryl Morey are one at the, one in the same. Yeah. Like, attached to the hip basically throughout your NBA career. Mm-hmm. Now you hate him. Now you're demanding another trade. You were going to go to the Clippers. I, well, what do you what do you say about this dude at this point? Yeah, it seems like he's he's burning a lot of bridges, and yeah, it just seems like he doesn't like he doesn't care about winning. He just he's there to be there and make some it's money. Like what, what is besides just being James Harden and making a lot of money and hooping? Mm-hmm. Like what else is he? What what else is this for? Yeah. Which to a certain extent is fine. Like if 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 that's how you want to play your career, go for it. But here's the thing: why would any NBA team want to take that on? Right. Yeah. Attitude. That attitude is horrible. Mm-hmm. Why would you want that out of a star player? I'm just here to hoop, make my money, look cool for the crowd. Yeah. And if you piss me off, I'm gonna to try to ruin everything you have. Yeah. It becomes that's like what, that's what James Harden is. It becomes that toxic relationship of, oh, I can change him. You know, that <laughs> yeah. that kind of deal. Um, so, like, maybe that's what people are thinking. And he, he's obviously still super talented. He's still one of the best players in the NBA. Uh, but do you want to deal with everything else? Which has been a question for guys like Kyrie Irving and, like you said, Ben Simmons. But I think he's more closer comparatively to Kyrie Irving because they're both super, super talented still. But they just have some other things going on. And at this point, I would take Kyrie Irving over James Harden. And I don't don't even think it's close. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know where I'm at on that. At least with the other things in Brooklyn, he was standing for something. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just like, get me out of here. I hate all of this. I'm gone. Yeah. It it seemed at least he had a point. Even though it was, we're not going to get all the way into that. But, I, I don't know, man. I think because for like Kyrie Irving is re-signed with Dallas and is happily going back to trying to make it work with Luka Doncic. Yeah, because for me, I think uh, I think I might take. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I do take Kyrie, because even with all of Kyrie's other stuff that he's got going on, at least when he gets on the floor, it seems like he's still 
playing hard, even though I don't think him and Luca really make sense. But and uh, in terms of on court stuff, you've seen Kyrie play at the highest level in the playoffs. Yeah, you haven't seen James Harden do that. You've yeah. seen him play at a really good All Star level, and he can never get past that in the yeah. playoffs. He had like one good playoff game this past year, which is more than he usually has. But yeah, it, it's a it's a weird thing. We still have the Damian Lillard stuff going on in the background too that seemingly has made no progress. Um, but that's also there. And so yeah, the the NBA is gonna have to figure something out. Um, because right now the players are starting to take control, which to a certain extent is fine. I think they should, but uh, there needs to be more of a middle ground, I guess. I don't, obviously I'm not smart enough to know, know how that, how that would work out, but there's gotta be something they can do. Okay. On to the NFL. We've had a full week of the preseason. We've seen some, some highlights, some lowlights, um, but we've also in the yesterday, yesterday, I'm losing track of my days that uh, two veteran running backs finally got signed. Dalvin Cook got signed to the Jets, and Zeke Elliott got signed to the Patriots. Now, we're on opposite sides of the spectrum of this that we found out. Um, So let's just hear your take, Malik, and then I'll respond. Do you like Dalvin Cook to the Jets more or Zeke Elliott to the Patriots more? I like Zeke Elliott to the Patriots more. Hmm. And it's because I feel like he's the exact type of running back Bill Belichick covets and like respects the most. A guy that, even though he's he's not rushing for fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred yards anymore, a guy that will pass block mm-hmm. just as hard as he runs. At this point in his career, he's willing to just be the the big back that gets the tough yards. Mm-hmm. He showed that in Dallas last year. It, obviously, Tony Pollard was taking over as the number one guy, and Zeke played his role and he played it well. Yeah. Did he have, like, 12 rushing touchdowns last year? He had double-digit rushing rushing touchdowns. Yeah, I think he had 12. It was still extremely effective in what he did. I think Ramondre Stevenson is coming on. I think he is their running back of the future. But in this era of keeping running backs healthy and teams not wanting to pay running backs Mm -hmm. and running backs not having the longest shelf, I think that it helps Ramondre Stevenson. It takes pressure off of him in like pass blocking situations in times where he doesn't have to just keep ramming into the offensive line and the front seven of other teams over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. You can give those tough carries to Zeke, who's still willing to do it. And I think he could be a good balance. Now, with Dalvin Cook, <laughs> I'm not a fan. Yeah, And even with Brees Hall coming off an of injury, I feel like Michael Carter is getting better and they have a young guy that they can play along with Brees Hall already. Mm -hmm. Dalvin Cook may not be a top three back anymore, but he's still a guy that can get you over a thousand yards and he can still catch out of the backfield. He's still dangerous with the ball in his hands. Yeah. That to me, that's the difference between him and Zeke Elliott. Mm -hmm. Zeke Elliott is still efficient with the ball in his hands. Dalvin Cook is still dangerous. And he will still be treated as a number one back whenever he's in the game. Mm-hmm. Brees Hall, in my mind, is the number one running back on that team. Yeah. He should be. It was clear that he was becoming one of the better running backs in the league already right. as a rookie last year before he tore his ACL. Mm-hmm. He was running through everybody. And he's just he's overall balanced and a really good running back. Yeah. And I feel like whenever Delvin Cook gets hot, the crowd is going to start going crazy for him. They're going to want him to stay in the game. And I wouldn't be – I would understand if Brees Hall kind of like got a little upset and disgruntled if that started happening mm. because he put his heart on the line for the Jets last year, tore his ACL, showed what type of talent he is, showed he is the running the, the number one running back. And then you bring in a num- another number one running back that could be out of his prime very soon. Mm-hmm but a guy that is still explosive and a guy that will still get everybody excited every time he gets a touch. Mm -hmm. I hate both of the moves. (laughs) I I still hate both of them. Um, I think 
The problem is I think Zeke has too much name value nowadays. Does he? I think he does. He, last year, to me, last year, his name value, he was a Dallas Cowboy running back, and Tony Pollard took over his position. Yeah. Like, to me, it, it completely shifted last year. But he still got 12 stinking touchdowns. People are going to look at his numbers of, like, he was efficient from five yards out. It's, it's true. But Dallas also has one of the best offensive lines in the, the entire NFL. So, like, you don't well, think that helps well, they, a little bit? They did. I think their their offensive line has started to get older. Yeah, it was still a good O line, but it's not the dominant O line it was right. when Zeke first came into the league. But it's still upper it's still echelon. Good. Yeah. Um. So I think some of that stuff is inflated. His actual running, I think, has not looked all that good in the last few I, years. I think he still has good vision, and the fact that he still runs as hard as he runs. A lot of players will like front sevens. Obviously, play physical. Mm. But what he gets, like you said, he gets good blocking. Yeah. Once he gets four or five yards into, like, past the O line, mm-hmm. you got safeties and corners coming at you, and he's still running that hard. Yeah. Like that's still valuable in today's game. I just feel like too the 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 way that the Patriots system works, like, they can find other guys to do what Zeke Elliott does, I guess. Um, and I am nervous that because Zeke Elliott has that that name value that he's going to take away touches from Ramondre Stevenson, who upped his workload last year because Damian Harris ended up getting hurt. And I think he looked pretty good doing it. He was able to be kind of the the main guy, which I know the Patriots don't usually do, but just seemed like he could handle the workload. So I'm hoping that it doesn't hurt his development because he's hit. Ramondre is a third-year player now, which is usually kind of, when a running back would hit their wheelhouse. Um, and then Dalvin Cook, uh, he's another one that he did have a good season last year, but just when I watched him, it just it didn't look pretty. Um, his efficiency numbers, I know, were also down last year. He is also getting older, same with Zeke Elliott. They're both aging running backs. Um, the only thing that's helping the situation with Dalvin Cook is that Brees Hall is – coming off of an ACL injury. So I do think they need somebody. Um, you mentioned Michael Carter. I also, I'm a huge fan of Israel Abanaconda too. Yeah. The rookie they got from well, Pitt. So I, I want him to get touches also. And, and he might not get touches now. Well, and at this point, like Michael Carter, they signed James Robinson last year because they didn't believe in Michael Carter, even though Michael Carter had a pretty good rookie season. Whole, but then James the Robinson is out also now. So yeah. it, it's that that situation but it's, it's is just so weird. It's just yeah, exactly. It's weird. Um, the other like swirling rumors are that Aaron Rodgers really wanted Dalvin Cook. I'm sure he did. Listen. To me, that's terrifying. <laughs> um, I, I'm just I'm not going to go into the Aaron Rodgers rant, but there's this this whole thing of how like Aaron Rodgers is some angel from the sky to New York. All of a sudden. If you're a Jets fan, he is. When last year, I, well, it's just to to news media, it feels like. Like, all of a sudden, Aaron Rodgers is back to, he's two years removed from MVP, back-to-back MVPs. Okay, well, last year he sucked. He was terrible. It was, it was his first. We're just forgetting about it that? It was his first season ever not being great, though. And then now there's all this talk. All it was this his talk, first season ever not being great. There's all this talk about the Jets' offensive line not being good. Like, He's, he's he can't run as much as he used to, so he's got to be protected. Um, luckily, he has guys like Garrett Wilson and all his other slew of friends that he brought along with him. Now there's talk that David Bakhtiari might go to the Jets. Didn't he retire? I don't think so. I thought, I thought, but, I thought he retired. Um, I mean, maybe. I don't keep up with Maybe that was Ali Marpet. I'm just getting all offensive <laughs> linemen mixed up. I um, think Ali Marpet retired. But... I'm also just now scared that even when Brees Hall comes back healthy, similar to like you said, if Dalvin Cook gets on any sort of roll, people will Jet, almost forget yes. Brees Hall. Jets fans will be chanting J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. Which Every time just, he gets in the end zone, and they'll be going nuts for Dalvin Cook. Which is just Cook. so terrible because Brees Hall was one of the best running backs in the league last year before he got yeah, hurt. Besides Sauce Gardner, he was like almost the leader of that youth movement. Mm-hmm. Him and Garrett Wilson. But yeah. he, he was carrying them. In, in those tough games. Yeah. Brees Hall might have beaten out Garrett Wilson for offensive rookie exactly. of the year. Yeah. Um, 
so I don't know. It just scares me when they bring in these veterans that have name value um, that could hurt the development of these these younger players. And especially, like, at least, again, at least the Jets are maybe in contention uh, for a deeper playoff run, so Dalvin Cook makes sense. The Patriots, I feel like, are lost. So getting a guy like Zeke Elliott doesn't really do a whole lot. Well, that that's like <laughs> unless he's a good locker room guy, I guess. That that's from the fan perspective. Bill Belichick isn't saying we're lost. Well, <laughs> let's just get Zeke Elliott. He's saying he he probably he watched he watches more tape than we do. Yeah. So he probably watched everything Zeke did for the Cowboys last year. Mm-hmm. Getting those in in his somewhat limited role, the fact that he scored as much as he did, the fact that he averaged a, as much a carry as he did. And just played his role and was able to step back and lose his ego last year. Yeah. Bill Belichick loves that type of player. I don't know. Did Zeke Elliott really lose his ego yet last year? They gave him 12 touchdowns. But that's because. So Red, then he Red can Red go to the next team. Yards. He can go to the next team and be like, hey, I got 12 touchdowns. Even though Tony Pollard, like. I don't think Zeke Elliott has ran. ever been known for. <laughs> but we both know what happened last year. Tony Pollard was the best running back on the Cowboys. Everybody accepted it. We accepted it. Everybody said that's what happened. There's a reason why they didn't resign him mm-hmm. because Tony Pollard is the guy. Yeah. We we know what it is. Him getting 12 touchdowns is him sticking to his role and just running tough, running the way he always runs. He doesn't have the burst anymore, so you you give him touches in a certain space. Yeah, like Zeke Elliott still got more carries than thinking Tony Pollard. He averaged 3.8 yards a carry. That's not very good. 231 carries for 876 yards and 12 touchdowns. He ran for 10 and 26. Oh, well, that was against San Francisco. But, like, his last to end the season last year, Ezekiel Elliott, where did it just go? Dang it. He went against Philly, who was a good defense. 16 for 55 yards. Tennessee, decent defense. 19 for 37 yards. Washington, 8 for 10 yards. And then in the playoffs, Tampa Bay, 13 for 27 yards. San Francisco, 10 for 26 yards. You know why? Because, because he he's Zeke Elliott. Because he doesn't have burst anymore, Joey. I just said he can't he can't burst through those holes and, and take off anymore. He can get you a few yards and and score on the on the in the red zone. Exactly. That is what he gives you. But and that, that's why that's why he lost his job in Dallas. That's why they didn't resign him. But they still gave him 231 carries over Tony Pollard, that, who had a great of, season. That's because of the Cowboys. <laughs> that's because they're the Dallas Cowboys, Joe. They still wanted to try and show people that Zeke is still Zeke, even though he was fading back into the background. I'm just they're, they're the Dallas Cowboys. I'm just nervous. Bill Belichick isn't <laughs> what they are. Well, we'll see. I'll listen. If Zeke Elliott gets... I don't think he's going to get more carries than Ramondre Stevenson. I do think that's over. I'm just scared that he might get too many snaps. Now, if okay. he's specifically that, like, third and two kind of guy and, like, short yardage... That's exactly what I think to he's going to be. Yeah. Then maybe we're fine. I'm just scared he's going to get a little more than that. And that kind of thing makes me nervous. Listen, if, if Ramondre Stevenson... Ho- uh, let's hope this doesn't happen. If he gets some kind of injury, then we worry. Yeah. Cause, cause then things start to get very strange. Yeah. But as long as Ramon J. Stevenson is healthy in the number one, I don't think it gets weird. I think Ezekiel Elliott plays his role. Yeah. And then, like I said, Dalvin cook. Sure. Listen, it's Bill, Bill okay. Belichick is the same coach that tried to get Fred Taylor to play special teams. Okay. Yeah. He, he might have changed some since then, but he's still the same type of coach that will, yeah. Mm-hmm. He makes you play a certain role. Yeah. And then, yeah. Dalvin Cook, is he's okay. But when Brees Hall comes back, that will be the interesting part. So, all right. Let's get on to some of the positives. Um, Anthony Richardson got named as the starter for the Colts. Not super surprised, but there were some people that were thinking that Gardner Minshew might start this season because he was looking good in training camp and and stuff like that. Um, but I think a guy like Anthony Richardson just needs reps. Um, I agree. So I like I like him starting. I think Gardner Minshew is 
basically a known quantity. Yeah, Yeah, he's a known quantity at this point, so I don't think him being the starter is going to really do anything for the team unless Anthony Richardson was, like, throwing a pick every single practice or something like that. Um, Do you have – what do you think – the Colts are going to look like with Anthony Richardson? I think it's going to be a mixed bag, a lot like what Josh Allen looked like his first few years in Buffalo, mm-hmm. where the the standout plays, the explosive plays are incredible, and you see the vision, but the negative plays are like he still has a long way to go. Yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of that this first season in Indianapolis. Now, I don't know what his learning curve will be. Maybe he like catches on quicker than Josh Allen. Mm-hmm. maybe he also needs more time or just as much time. You never know what a quarterback's timetable is yeah, or when they figure it out just like that, when it clicks. So I'm excited to see it. I think he showed in that preseason game everything that he's going to bring, the good and the bad. Mm-hmm. He dropped a few dimes. He looked good at times. He looked comfortable in the pocket. He threw. He took a weird risk throwing that sidearm, throwing through a pick. Mm-hmm. He's, he's going to have those up and down moments. Yeah. I think he'll be and, definitely like yeah. high highs and low lows. Like other, second year Josh Allen, I think he, he got Buffalo to the playoffs mm-hmm. in his second year, and he still wasn't that good yet. Yeah. So and he's in a division where he could take advantage with his yeah, talent. I think the other exciting part is that we haven't seen him run yet, and we probably won't for out, throughout the most of the uh, preseason. But once we get into real games, I'm sure they'll yeah. they'll unload a little bit, which will be cool. Um which also makes me hope that Jonathan Taylor comes back sooner rather than later. I, I forget about him. Yeah. It really seems like he's just not going to play. We it's still have Josh weird. Josh Jacobs, Jonathan Taylor, and J.K. Dobbins are still all out there. J.K. Dobbins supposedly is supposed to be reporting within this week, um, but who knows? Jonathan Taylor, though, and Josh Jacobs, yeah, I don't, I don't know how that stuff's going to work out. So no updates on that. Let's talk about the Lions for a minute. Lions had their first preseason game. They won against the Giants. I don't care about wins and losses in the preseason. Yeah. Um, I just care about the rookies. Uh, what was the standout and the disappointment in that first preseason game for you? That was, well, it, the disappointment is Nate Sudfeld, but did, do, do we even need to bring him up? Like, No. Is yeah, Nate Sudfeld looked like he was back at Indiana Mm -hmm. and not good college Nate Sudfeld, like freshman year. He he looked like I don't know. Yeah. Like he forgot how to play in several moments. Yeah. I'm curious actually if the Teddy Bridgewater thing actually got to him. It it was weird. Uh the JMO drop was that was tough. Mm -hmm. That's those are the types of plays he has to make to be productive, and we assume the type of plays he will make Mm -hmm. because he'll get open downfield a lot. Right. And he, even though – what am I trying to say? The, the the DB was on him, so it was it was kind of a tougher catch, but that's yeah. going to happen in the NFL. Right. Every catch isn't going to be wide open for you to just sprint 50 yards. Right. So, yeah, he's he's got to learn how to consistently make tough catches. Bright side, I think your defensive picks, they shined. Mm-hmm. Jack Campbell had those back-to-back plays where he stuffed the line. He was the, gr- the highest-graded rookie – in the preseason. Yeah, Brian Branch has been showing out mm-hmm. since he stepped on the field in training camp. He had that big hit in the first quarter. Yeah. You know what he brings, that level of physical, and he can cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jameer Gibbs didn't get a lot. Of, it was weird. They kept, like, just giving him carries up the middle over and over again. Yeah. Maybe they're just they're just hiding everything they want to do with him, I would assume, which is fine. I would assume so. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I agree. It was a little. Uh, just I, I assume just getting him warm was fine. Yeah. He had that catch out of the backfield where Nate Sudfeld threw it behind him, but he still turned around and got it mm-hmm. and got a nice gain. So, yeah, I, I, we won't know what to think about Kobe Sorsdahl and <laughs> the defensive tackle from Western Kentucky. We yeah. won't know what to think about them till like two or three years down the road. Right, right now it's just about the guys that everybody knows, mm-hmm. and we're pretty confident they hit on them. Yeah. Uh, I would say kind of the same thing. Like, for me, the highlights were the, the defensive rookies. Rodrigo looked good, too. Yeah, coming back in a second. Year. The uh, the low light is probably Jamison Williams, um, just because this is going to be the only time we see him until yeah. week seven. Um, so I want to see a little bit more out of him. There was a couple times where it looks like, you know, him and the quarterback weren't on the same page, which is a little concerning. Um, it's hard to know whose fault that is, obviously from a fan perspective. 
Um, and then, yeah, I was also a little disappointed with not being able to see Jameer Gibbs really do a whole lot. Um, they did put him out wide a few times, but they didn't really do anything with it. Um, which I don't need them to like show their whole playbook, of course, but just giving him some reps, catching the ball would be nice. Um, I have another one, but overall it was, it was pretty good. Yeah, go ahead. I like every late round and free agent receiver decision they made. Hmm. I like Chase Cota. I liked him in college. I, I said I thought Antoine Green was a really good pick. Yeah. And Dylan Drummond from Eastern. Yeah. He's got he's got a little something. Mm-hmm. I like those young, scrappy receivers that most likely are gunning for one spot. <laughs> right. One or two spots. Yeah. But I, I like those young guys. I like the picks that they've made. Yeah. In terms of skill positions, even not even the be on the top picks. Yeah. Trying to whittle down their receivers is gonna be tough. Yeah. Chase Coda led them in receptions in that game. Yeah. Because after Amon Ross Sam Brown, Jamison Williams, Josh Reynolds, Marvin Jones, Khalif Raymond, and then you got all the new guys, guys that you just mentioned, plus Denzel Mims. Um Yeah, they're all gunning for either practice squad spot or yeah, that right. last roster spot for a receiver. Yeah. The nice thing is that the lines might be deep at receiver yeah. all of a sudden, which was a problem beforehand. Um Oh, I did. I also didn't mention. I think Sam Laporta looked pretty good. He didn't get a lot of looks. He had that one drop, which yeah. he, he he. That's a catch he usually makes. Those but tough like, catches. At least like his route running and stuff looked good. Yeah. Um. So that's that's a good sign. Uh. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is, are we a little bit too low on the NFC North? We saw some good some good things from Jordan Love and the Packers. Yeah. We saw some good things from Justin Fields, DJ Moore. Screen and, pass legends. And the Bears. Yeah, but just in general, like they looked better than expected. They could be explosive. We know the Vikings are a They're the Vikings. They're gonna they're kind they're of gonna a weird win, team. They're gonna win like ten games. They're, like, they're talented enough, but yeah. they're also not talented enough. They're that middling team. Um Is this division gonna be tougher than we think? I still I have to see Jordan. We all have to see Jordan Love play more than a, a, a game or two. Mm-hmm. Seeing him for a full season is like the first time we're going to get the real sample size. Right. Like with Aaron Rodgers, he sat behind Brett Favre for four years. And mm-hmm. his first season as a starter, a lot of people still doubted him. After his first season, by the end of his first season is when people finally started to say, this guy can be really good. Yeah. So they've got good young skill talent. They've I, I like the picks they've made. They still have some things on defense to figure out, mm-hmm. so I think that might be a challenge. But on offense, they've got talent. It all comes down to Jordan Love. Yep. The Bears, they've 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 uh, they're surprised. They got some things to think about. Yeah, I mean, like fans around the NFL have things to think about when you watch the Bears mm-hmm. because if Justin Fields starts to look like he did at Ohio State, yeah, or it if gets he, really if, scary. If even if he just um, Cause the running is ob- obviously already there. Yeah, if if he just improves a little bit from last year, even a little bit, it, it, yeah, it'll start to get scary. Yeah, like is these they got it? They got DJ Moore. I like we all like Herbert. Well, we don't all like Herbert. I like Herbert, but as like as a player, we all know he's a good young player. Yeah. Plus they they have Donta Foreman if they needed. They also have Roshan Johnson, so like they have other guys. Yeah. Um, and Philip Walker, they got him mm. as a backup. But like. I don't know. Seeing those teams makes me not as confident. And I I think the Lions are are a team that are not going to take another team for granted. I don't think that's how Dan Campbell is. So I don't think I think they'll be prepared every week. But I'm a little bit scared of like maybe, you know, they take a team a little too lightly and somebody could knock them off. Like you said, I think the Packers, if Jordan Love turns out good, He's got Romeo Dobbs. He's got Christian Watson, Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon, Luke Musgrave looks really good, actually. And they drafted uh, Tucker Craft from North Dakota State too. Yeah, Jaden Reed looks pretty solid for them. He he might he, be their slot he might guy. Be, he might be dangerous. Um, so like their their skill positions are gonna be good. So it's kind of like you said, like if Jordan Love turns out to be good, the Packers might be not as bad. They're, as They're gonna be a lot of points put up in the NFC North. It yeah. seems like. So if things go right, I think the Lions still run the division. I just, I'm just, they should run the division, hoping that they don't 
get too ahead of themselves. And again, I don't think that's how Dan Campbell is. I don't think like Jared Goff or Amon Ross St. Brown or guys like that. I think we've built a good enough culture to not do that. But I will say the NFC North, I think, is going to be better than people think. Um, which is scary as a Lions fan when you think the division is basically locked up in ours already. So, any other uh, preseason standouts that you wanted to talk about real quick? Uh, guys that I liked. Uh, I, I got to give a shout out to the guy I said on here, if the Lions didn't draft Hendon Hooker, Dorian Thompson Robinson, man. Yep. We were both on Thompson Robinson. He officially is getting the start for their next preseason game. Yeah. And it looks like he might be their backup going into the season. Mm-hmm. He's he just flat out beat out um Kellen Mond. Yes. And he's look good, man. Mm-hmm. He looks like he played four years of college. Yeah. Understands the game. He knows when to run. He knows when to stay in the pocket and just stay calm. I I like him a lot, man. Yeah. I like him a lot. I do too. Yeah, my like, boy. Oh, were you about to say something? No, I was just, I was just agreeing with you. Uh, my guy from Kansas State, the five-five legend that is already making people look ridiculous in the open field, Deuce mm-hmm. Vaughn. When they picked it, I mean, when the Dallas Cowboys picked him, I kind of figured it was kind of like a novelty pick because his dad coaches for the team. Yeah, but when they gave him carries, they it, there was no faking, like. Somebody meets him at the line of scrimmage. He spins off them. He makes somebody else miss six yards. Mm-hmm. Next carry, he gets like five yards. Carry after that, gets five yards, makes somebody miss 15 yards. Yeah. You give him the ball and you give him, you give him space, it is going to be a show. Mm-hmm. And he's tough and he, he can block. He's he, he's only like 180 before his size. Like I've said before, 180 at 5'5", five, five, yeah. he's chiseled. Mm-hmm. He's strong. I have a lot of confidence in Deuce Vaughn. And you can you can see that like the linebackers and stuff are having trouble seeing him coming yeah. through the line. He lit, he juked out the Jaguar safety. Mm-hmm. The safety and the linebacker butted heads. Yeah. <laughs> because it it was hilarious to watch. Mm-hmm. But anybody else? Um The guys that I was gonna mention are uh it's crazy enough to think that the Rams may have their future quarterback with Stetson, Stetson Bennett. And like, he looks I, solid. I like Puka Nakua a lot, too, from BYU, yeah. the receiver. Yeah, so, like, they could be good if – or they could be all right moving forward, at least, with Stetson Bennett. Um, I think the funny one was Aiden O'Connell having a good preseason oh, game. He, he was, like, 16 of 18. Yeah. Listen, uh, that in college, he was a guy that was just, like, a surgeon. Yeah. Just precision. Mm-hmm. Um, my biggest standout, which it's, it's probably going to take him a little while to actually get meaningful time because of the guys in front of him – but A.T. Perry, he looked good. Yes, Just big I receiver. Um, he was fun to watch. I, I watched a lot of that game, actually. Yeah, he's 6'5", and he runs like he's like six foot. He's yeah. really fluid. Now, they did, of course, they drafted Chris Olave, and then Michael Thomas will probably age out pretty soon here. Um, they also have uh, Rashid Shahid, who is hurt right now, I believe. Um, I've seen Saints fans on social media hyping him up like he's... He had some decent games last year. He did, um, <laughs> but... Yeah, exactly. So, A.T. Perry might be able to get in there sooner rather than later, but he could he could be something good, especially for Derek Carr, who likes to just throw deep. Yeah. Can so. I give you one guy that kind of looked like what I thought he it was and what I think he will be? Okay. Good old boy, Will Levis. Oh, boy. There's a lot of arm... He's mobile. Look look at how hard he throws it, Joey. Yeah. Look at the velocity on his ball. Look at how pretty that throw is. Look are, at we, that. are we talking about Zach Wilson or Will Levis? Uh, uh, how <laughs> different are they? But look, Will Levis, uh, several underthrown balls. It's unfortunate you say that because I think today Malik Willis jumped him on the depth chart. I mean, he he looked better. He looked like he made a bit of a mm-hmm. – he calmed down. Last year with Tennessee when he played, it looked like he couldn't calm. Like he was yeah. – he didn't know what to do. Yeah. He looked like he knew what he was doing for it's the just, most part against Chicago. It's just scary that, you know, Tennessee has now taken back-to-back quarterbacks, and the one that they took last year is now ahead of the one they took this year. It, uh, it's just yeah. not looking good. Well, Will Levis looked exactly like the guy I think he is. Like, yeah, It's always going to look pretty coming out of his hand, mm-hmm. but it, it, it'll be underthrown sometimes. It'll be overthrown the other times. His last pick, he just threw it up at, like in between the corner and safety. Mm-hmm. There was nobody really there, like, Will Levis just does things sometimes. Yeah. The 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 one other one that I'll talk about, and then we can get into some college football. Um, are you 
I don't know how to word it. Are you are you buying into this downfall of third round pick Jake Moody? Did you see he he hit like a sixty yard field goal in practice or something? And I saw then, his first kick. He missed like a forty yard. Or yeah, something. and then in the the game he he missed like a forty and a fifty or something, and then people all of a sudden lost it, and they're like, the San Francisco 49ers spent a third round pick on this guy. It was listen. It was his first preseason game, so. It's just kind of funny. I'm, I'm not worried yet. That, mm. that could be first game jitters. If it continues, then yeah, you get worried. Right. Yeah, the track record of highly picked kickers outside of just uh, Justin Tucker, it's not very good. Yeah. It's just interesting to see. I, I think Rough it's funny story. when people overreact, but yeah. I'm kind of with you. All right. Let's, uh, let's get into some college football talk. I don't know if you had any specific teams that you wanted to point out. We went over the top 25 last year, but if there's any team – that you want to go into more depth about. Um, we could even go into more Michigan and Michigan State since next week we're going to try to cover all of college football next week. Um, so just starting off, it looks like Jim Harbaugh is not going to have a suspension, and he's just going to play the whole season, which, like we said before, it's not really a big deal. Four games wouldn't have mattered. They would have went 4-0 in those first four games. Um but I guess it just helps for continuity sakes. What is the outlook for the Michigan Wolverines this season? I mean, it's from the fan perspective is kind of half and half. There's the egotistical fans that think like they're obviously going to go 12 and 0 and this, they're definitely going to finally win a playoff game and they could get to the national championship. I'm, more balanced where I think there there's obvious two there are two obvious games they could lose mm-hmm. at Penn State and against Ohio State at home in the last game of the uh, year yeah I think Maryland will also be a tough game Maryland also plays them tough they're at East Lansing this year too. yeah Michigan Michigan always I mean Michigan State always scares me so that's a yeah but 11 and 1 is most likely what I expect I think they drop Penn State most likely mm-hmm and the the team expectations is national championship. Yeah. That's the team expectation. I'm too afraid as a fan to have that expectation because I'm I'm this isn't Georgia, this isn't Alabama. There's no long track record of me being confident that they can do it. Yeah. They have to prove it for the first time in my life mm-hmm. that they can actually get over the hump. Right. And I'm afraid I'm still afraid they can't do it. Yeah. And they they've, even, they've yeah. been struggling in the playoff, so Yeah, even with having an incredible running back duo the O line is going to be top three, arguably number one again. JJ McCarthy should be getting better. The receiving core is experienced. Uh, everything is is set in place for the most part mm-hmm. for them to finally figure it out. Yeah, but they just they just have to do it. Like I, I, I don't. They just they just got to do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna save most my like deeper thoughts for the actual Michigan preview. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the the expectation is at least eleven and one. And winning a playoff game and winning the Big Ten again. Right. And it's terrifying having those types of expectations. Yeah. Which it just. Although it also kind of feels kind of good because a lot of fan bases never get those types of chances. Yeah. And I mean, they get their core, Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards back, which is nice to see. Um, Shout out also, I just just made me realize did you see Ronnie Bell's catch for the 49ers? Yeah. He's going to be a good pro. Um, that was cool to see. Um, let's let's mention that top team, the Georgia Bulldogs. Can they do it again? Hundred percent. A hundred. Look at their schedule, Joey. <laughs> I want you to read off their first four or five games. Well, that's every team. UT, that's not every team. <laughs> UT Martin, Ball State, South Carolina, and UAB, and then Auburn. Then Kentucky, then Vanderbilt, for then Florida. for a SEC team. <laughs> yeah, that's the top team in the country. That's cupcake. Yeah, but they've done it two years in a row, mm-hmm. and they've they have these type of cupcake openings a lot. They've they the the way they've just stacked talent, mm-hmm. class after class of top two classes. The way Kirby Smart has finally figured out what his formula is. Mm-hmm. They they could they're most likely the new college football dynasty. 
they they most likely are. Like there's <laughs> the odds on them winning the national championship are probably higher than anybody else just because how do you trust anybody more than them? Yeah. Like you expect their defense to be deep and extremely <laughs> talented and fast and physical. You expect their offense to just be efficient and make plays when they need to like they always do. Yeah. Brock Bowers has been the best tight end in the country for the past year and a half. Mm-hmm. Like after the second half of his freshman season, he was basically the best tight end in the country. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's yeah, they're they're just so good. Now they they do have some things to figure out in training camp. I saw they have three or four. I mean, I think three running backs that are all like banged up. Yeah. They're still trying to figure out who their number one receiver could be. Lad McConkey is back for his fourth year, I believe. And I don't know if he's a true number one. Mm-hmm. Their new quarterback is most likely going to be Carson Beck. Yeah. I was going to say, I feel like that actually might be one of their their tougher things is that he's got a, a big role to fill. As much as we kind of clown on Stetson Bennett, he, he got kinda, it done. He kind of carried them yeah, at points. He got it done. But what with that opening schedule and then being Georgia, like what? I, if, yeah, I mean, there, there's no way their defense can win. Yeah, from everything I've seen from Carson, he's been a backup for the past two years. Mm-hmm. In the spring game, it looked like he was clearly ahead of the curve. Like he's accurate. He yeah. has a big arm. He's more. He's a more talented passer than Stetson Bennett. Mm-hmm. Is he a winner? Is he a gamer like Stetson Bennett? That's what we need to see. Because right. you knew when the lights came on, Stetson was going to make plays and get it done. Yeah, we have to see if Carson Beck can do that. Mm-hmm. He has all the talent to do it. Yeah. But, yeah, Georgia's by far. They're, they're the unanimous number one in the country to start. Mm-hmm. Let's just go through this, the rest of this top four of them real quick. Alabama, again, they also have to replace a lot of things. Um, they've done it in the past, um, but they got to replace um, Bryce Young and Jameer Gibbs especially, um, who did a lot of things for them. How do you see Alabama bouncing back this year? Or do they, for once – not necessarily bounce back. This is one of those years in the preseason where fans and analysts are either saying this might be the end of the dynasty or they're going all in saying this is one of those years where Nick Saban shows everybody why he's Nick Saban. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of sliding more to the second one where I think this could be one of those years where they don't, get picked to win the SEC. There are a lot of people that have LSU picked to win the SEC. Yeah. And because their quarterback situation might not be figured out until week one or week two, they're still going to be trying to figure that out. They might be going back to running the ball more. Their defense is kind of inexperienced. Yeah. This is Alabama, man. We saw them spread the ball around a lot last year. They didn't have one guy. That... Bryce Young was the offense. Yeah. like He carried everything. We've known in years past they've always had either – a dominant running back or some dominant receiver. Yeah. They didn't really have that last year. I know obviously Jameer Gibbs did a lot for the team. Um, but yeah, like you said, like Bryce Young kind of just controlled the offense. Um, so yeah. I think it'll be an interesting uh, year for Alabama. Yeah. This is a season where they're trying to get back to that balance that they used to have. Mm-hmm. And it uh, they, they got talent everywhere. I expect a receiver will step up this year. They actually, they got a guy from a junior college named Malik Benson. He was the top junior college player in the country. Everybody says he looks like an absolute monster in training camp. So yeah. they probably have another number one guy. Their running backs are going to be really good. Their O-line should be really good. They always have guys coming back on defense. This year, I think the star is going to be Dallas Turner, who was the pass rusher opposite um, uh, the – Pick to the Texans, the defensive end from Alabama. Will Anderson. Yeah, he was opposite Will Anderson last year. He's a physical beast, too. Not as much as Will Anderson, but he's he's also a beast. Yeah. Uh, they got Kool-Aid McKinstry at corner coming back. Mm-hmm. And I think the guy that's most hyped up as a freshman, safety Caleb Downs. He was a five-star guy from Georgia. He was elite on both sides of the ball coming out of high school. People said he could start at receiver or at DB. He's most likely going to start at Alabama from the jump. He's like 6'2", 200. He's like that good stepping into college. So he's probably going to be a stud. I think this is another year where Alabama, you don't underestimate Alabama. Don't do it. Yeah. Like, is it's not worth it. Mm-hmm. Now, there there is a chance that Texas game in week two is close. Yeah. Texas almost beat them last year. Texas 
Should be even better this year. I'm going to save that for the Big 12 preview. Yep. Still the last the year in the Big 12. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, don't don't let a close game against Texas in Week 2 cloud your judgment. They're still at that level. Yeah. And they shouldn't be taken lightly. And then we, we touched on it a little bit last week. Um, the Buckeyes. Replacing C.J. Stroud. Them. Um, but that team, the, the guy that everybody's been talking about, and he's even gotten more hype lately, Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, supposedly wants to run in the four threes. threes. Yeah. Uh, he thinks he can run the, I think he said he could, he could run a four, three flat. That would be, if he did that, it's the, the world might break. If I heard a correction that people said it was high four threes, but either way, it's crazy. They showed that his dad ran a four, three, eight, um, four inches shorter and so many pounds less than he is. Um, but where do you see Ohio state going after having to replace CJ Stroud, but still having a lot of their skill players, they still have a Buka there. Um, they did lose Jackson Smith and Jigba, but he didn't really play last year. Um, where do you see the Buckeyes this year? Are they going to make it back to the playoff or there's a good chance they make it back to the playoff, but I think there's also a chance, and this isn't me, Mayor, wearing my Michigan goggles. <laughs> I think this is a chance where, kind of like the first year Dwayne Haskins was the starter at Ohio State, where they're a really good team, the offense is a juggernaut, the defense is good, but they run into those one or two games where things just go sideways, mm-hmm. and they don't ultimately make the run they think they should have made. That year, they got blown out by Iowa at Iowa, Mm -hmm. and that kind of knocked things off the track. This year, the game at Notre Dame, week four, they should be expected to win that game, but it'll probably be a single-digit spread. Yeah. And depending on how good Sam Hartman is looking for Notre Dame in the first few weeks, that could be a sketchy game. The Penn State game, I think they win that one, but Mm -hmm. it could be close. I don't know why. That game against Maryland is weird to me. Hmm. Maryland almost like if if Talia Tungavaloa doesn't get hurt against Michigan last year, they have a chance to almost beat Michigan. Hmm. They stayed with Ohio State the almost the whole game until like the last six minutes. Yeah. The last year. They have increased their talent every year. Talia's back for his last year. Their receiving core is super talented. Their running back room is good. Their defense is always the thing. You never know what Maryland's defense is going to look like. Sometimes they look good. Sometimes they just get bombed. Mm -hmm. And that could have happened against Ohio State. And it's a home game. So Ohio State most likely likely is going to win by double digits. Yeah. But I I, I don't know. That just seems like a game to me that could be really weird. Where Tali is just like going back and forth with the predicted starter, Kyle McCord. Yeah. Who was Marvin Harrison's quarterback in high school. It could get weird. Mm-hmm. It could get weird. Kind of like, maybe like the, the Michigan-Illinois game last year where it looked like Illinois was going to beat them and then Michigan won in the very last second. Right. That game against Maryland could could be that type of game to me. Hmm. Ohio State should have like uh, 11-1 and one should be like the expectation or right. maybe 12-0. and 0. Yeah. But after losing to Michigan two years in a row, and them going to Michigan for this game, it's insane to say Michigan should beat Ohio State three times in a row. Yeah. But they they probably should. And it should should come down to that again, where Michigan and Ohio State should be undefeated going into those games. We haven't gotten to to Penn State yet, which we will with the Big Ten preview. But there are a lot of people that think it could be a three-way 11-1 tie going after the season ends, Mm -hmm. where Penn State beats Michigan, Ohio State beats Penn State, and Michigan beats Ohio State. That would be wild. And it comes down to, like, whatever else happened in the regular season. Right. Hmm. Yeah, that would be fun. Um. So, yeah, uh, next week we'll uh, we'll do, like, a full-out college football previews. Um, we'll go through kind of each conference, talk about a, a couple teams. Probably won't be able to go through all the teams. Yeah, the, some of the teams at the bottom – uh, just yeah. Yeah, mention a few words about them. Yeah. Um, we'll go into greater depth, of course, with the Big Ten. Um, we'll probably briefly talk about um, week two of preseason games for the NFL 
And then if by chance there's any other news or something, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll mention it. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're now we're back into the, the thick of college and NFL football. Before we know it, college basketball will be starting, and then the year will just be, uh, yeah. Just, yeah. And then we'll be in March Madness again, <laughs> summer will be over. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a cycle. It's crazy. Um, so, this has been Views from the Sidelines. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week. Uh, James Harden shouldn't be trusted anymore, and no team should pick him up. Let him leave gracefully and with a smile on his face. Partying at a, at a club.